on World News Tonight. Tense talks. Xi Jinping steps up bid to broker peace, but does he have a plan? More on this tonight. Utility takeover. Kremlin warns of more asset seizures after move against Fortum and Uniper. 13th day on. The fighting in Sudan continues despite the military ceasefire extension. And doggy daycare. Pups wag their tails as they get treated with snacks and playtime in Jordan. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and you're watching World News. Tonight, all eyes are on the long-awaited phone call between Chinese President Xi Jinping and Ukrainian counterpart Vladimir Zelensky. The conversation happened for the first time since the war in Ukraine began last year. She reportedly told Zelensky that Beijing will send an envoy to Kyiv to serve as a mediator to pursue a political settlement. For the first time since the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, Chinese President Xi Jinping held phone talks with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky on Wednesday. The phone call between the two leaders lasted for nearly an hour, with Zelensky noting that the talks were long and meaningful. Posting to Twitter, Zelensky also said that the phone conversation between the two leaders will give a powerful impetus to the development of their bilateral relations. The Chinese Foreign Ministry said Beijing's core stance is to facilitate talks for peace, noting that an envoy will be sent to Kyiv to facilitate peace talks. Beijing also stressed again that it has always stood on the side of peace on the Ukraine issue, adding that all parties involved reflect on the Ukraine crisis and seek a new way for everlasting peace in Europe. In response to the phone talks between the two leaders, Moscow praised Beijing's readiness to establish peace talks, but slammed Kyiv for rejecting any sound initiatives aimed at a settlement. While Washington welcomed the talks between Xi and Zelensky, it said it was too soon to tell if it would lead to a peace deal. The phone call follows a state visit to Russia by President Xi last month. As a traditional ally of Russia, China has refrained from denouncing Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but has taken on the role of a mediator in a bid to end the war in Ukraine. While China's role in the peace process has largely been met with skepticism, Ukraine has cautiously welcomed the initiative. Now, on the other hand, the Kremlin said it could seize more Western assets in retaliation for foreign moves against Russian companies after taking temporary control of assets belonging to two European state-owned utilities. Russia has seized control of local operations belonging to Western energy firms. Late Tuesday, President Vladimir Putin signed a decree establishing temporary control of assets belonging to Finland's Fortum and its former German subsidiary Uniper. The move will add to confusion over the fate of other Western firms in Russia amid plans for more sanctions on the country. Moscow has reacted angrily to reports that G7 nations could impose an almost total ban on exports to Russia. The EU is also looking at using frozen Russian assets to help rebuild Ukraine. Now the decree says Moscow has to take action to counter unspecified actions by the US and others. It outlines possible retaliation if Russian overseas assets are seized. But it also leaves much unclear. Fortum owned power plants and other facilities in Russia which were valued at around $1.9 billion late last year. It says it thinks the decree doesn't affect legal ownership of those assets. Uniper has five power stations in Russia. Both firms have been trying to find a way to exit the country altogether but may now have been overtaken by events. Now, the Yoon Biden summit laid out new visions. The summit really puts the emphasis on extended deterrence, which had a separate statement just for itself. Dubbed the Washington Declaration, it says the U.S. will decisively defend and deter a North Korean attack on Seoul, including through the use of nuclear weapons. This is a much-needed reassurance for South Koreans amid increasing threats from North Korea. Our mutual defense treaty is ironclad. President Joe Biden announced an agreement with South Korea on Wednesday that will give the key U.S. ally for the first time a bigger role in nuclear weapons planning over any conflict with North Korea. In a press conference at the White House with South Korean President Yoon suk yeol Biden directed a warning at North Korea, which continues to grow its arsenal of missiles and bombs. Look, a nuclear attack 
by North Korea against the United States or its allies or partisans uh, or partners is unacceptable and will result in the end of whatever regime were to take such an action. The announcement includes a renewed pledge by South Korea not to pursue a nuclear weapons program of its own. Officials said the U.S. will give South Korea more insights into and a voice in U.S. contingency planning to deter and respond to any nuclear incident in the region. As part of the deal, the U.S. will deploy a ballistic missile submarine to South Korea in a show of force, the first such deployment since the early 1980s. But Biden made it clear no U.S. nuclear weapons would be stationed on South Korean territory. I have absolute authority as commander-in-chief in law and the sole authority to use a nuclear weapon. But, you know, what the declaration means is that we're going to make every effort to consult with our allies when it's appropriate, if any action was so called for. The summit in Washington also comes just weeks after the leak of dozens of confidential U.S. documents, one of which gave details of internal discussions among senior South Korean officials about U.S. pressure on Seoul to supply weapons to Ukraine and its policy of not doing so. Did the recent leaks revealing that the U.S. was spying on South Korea come up at all in your discussions? With regard to that, we are communicating between our two countries and we are sharing necessary information. I believe that investigation is underway in the United States. So various and complex variables are always in play. We need time to wait for the investigation results by the United States, and we plan to continue to communicate on the matter. The talks at the White House also produced agreements on cybersecurity, electric vehicles and batteries, quantum technology, foreign assistance, and economic investment. Meanwhile, in the U.S., Speaker Kevin McCarthy's debt ceiling bill has passed in the House in a narrow 217 to 215 vote. The vote is a big win for McCarthy's test of power as he has faced early skepticism from members in swing districts. The nays are 217, the nays are 215, the bill is passed. In a mostly partisan vote on Wednesday, the U.S. House of Representatives narrowly passed a bill to raise the nation's $31.4 trillion debt ceiling defying President Joe Biden by attaching sweeping spending cuts for the next decade. We've done our job. The vote was a win for Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who hopes to lure Biden into negotiations on cutting spending. He's putting the American economy in jeopardy by his lack of action. However, the White House and congressional Democrats have been insisting on a debt limit increase with no strings attached. And if Congress fails to act, the U.S. Treasury Department could run out of ways to pay its bills in a matter of weeks. The bill proposed would increase Washington's borrowing authority by $1.5 trillion or until March 31st next year, whichever comes first, potentially setting up another debt showdown ahead of next election. It would also slash spending to 2022 levels, cap growth at 1% a year, repeal some tax incentives for renewable energy, and stiffen work requirements for some anti-poverty programs. McCarthy called on Biden to begin negotiations on a debt limit increase and spending cut bill, and for the Senate to either approve the House bill or pass its own. After the vote, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said Biden would not sign off on such cuts, adding, quote, the president has made clear this bill has no chance of becoming law. The president himself had some choice words when asking about extending the debt ceiling earlier in the day. That's not negotiable. A 2011 standoff over the debt limit led to a downgrade of the government's credit rating, which pushed borrowing costs higher and hammered investments. Let's go in for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back. Now, Charles III is about to be crowned king, not just of Britain, but of Commonwealth nations like Jamaica. But on the streets of the capital, Kingston, many Jamaicans want a break with a distant monarchy linked to slavery and colonialism. Former British colony Jamaica is distinctly cool on its new head of state, as Britain prepares to celebrate King Charles's coronation. Happy and glorious, as the UK's national anthem goes, isn't how many on the streets of Kingston would describe the two countries' history. Given a bitter legacy of slavery, 
and a plantation economy that enriched some Britons, but left many Jamaicans poor. The West Indian country of almost three million people remains under the British monarchy as part of the Commonwealth. We are moving on and we intend to... Prime Minister Andrew Holness told Prince William last year that Jamaica wants to become a republic. In March, he announced a constitutional reform committee to assist in the transition. Jamaica became independent in 1962, when Queen Elizabeth was on the throne. Affection for her and waves of immigration to Britain kept links alive. But even before Elizabeth's death last year, Republican sentiment was growing. About 600,000 Africans were brought to Jamaica as slaves between the 15th and 19th centuries, the National Library of Jamaica says. The British government was involved in the Atlantic slave trade and reimbursed plantation owners when slavery was abolished in 1834. During a visit by Prince William and Catherine last year, Jamaican protesters demanded an apology. William expressed profound sorrow over slavery, as has Charles. I cannot describe the depths of my personal sorrow. But the royals have stopped short of a formal apology. It's an undeniable truth that the slaves should also be compensated. Because if you say slavery is wrong, how do you justify compensating the slave owners? Danielle Archer is spokesperson for the Advocates Network, which planned those protests. Take a trip to any Caribbean island, any country that was under the grip of colonialism, you will see poverty. You will see where the resources have been taken from the land and placed in the wealthy. Charles has acknowledged growing Republican sentiment in some Commonwealth nations and said it was for them to decide. Barbados ditched the monarchy in 2021 and others are keen to follow. In Jamaica, that would require votes in both Houses of Parliament and a national referendum. Now, Sudan's army and a paramilitary force battled on Khartoum's outskirts, undermining a truce in their 11-day conflict. But the army expressed willingness to extend the ceasefire. WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus warned of many more deaths in Sudan due to outbreaks of disease and lack of essential health services amid intense fighting between the country's army and rival paramilitary groups. In a military statement, Sudan's army chief, General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, showed willingness to prolong the country's current three-day ceasefire for an additional 72 hours. The proposal was made by Regional African Bloc, the Intergovernmental Authority on Developments, and suggests both envoys from the Sudanese army and RSF paramilitary group meet for dialogue in the city of Juba in South Sudan. The current U.S. brokered ceasefire, set to last till late Thursday, has seen the intensity of the fighting somewhat ease, allowing thousands of Sudanese time to flee and for foreign countries to extract citizens. For those residents unable to leave, however, the dwindling supply of food, water, electricity and medical aid is pushing them to the brink. In more than four or five days, there will be no supplies left. We're trying to provide fruits and vegetables and keep up the supply, but we've run out of grains, canned food, flour and sugar. I have chronic diseases, diabetes and hypertension. Since the beginning of the fighting, I haven't found an open pharmacy. Though Sudan is already heavily dependent on aid, many humanitarian assistance agencies have also been forced to suspend operations. And the World Health Organization estimates 60% of Khartoum's medical centers are now closed. Meanwhile, dozens of Kenyans came to identify the remains of their relatives, thought to have starved themselves to death in hopes of going to heaven after the self-proclaimed Good News International Church, led by Patrick McKenzie. These are family members of the victims of the Kenyan hunger cult. On Wednesday, dozens of them were at a morgue in Malindi, identifying the remains of their loved ones. The morgue has been filling up rapidly since authorities started digging up human remains last week. Followers of the self-proclaimed Good News International Church are thought to have starved themselves to death in hopes of going to heaven. Stephen Muiti says he lost his wife and five children to the cult. He's among the many who have yet to identify their loved ones. My children are dead. I know that for sure. The young men who told me about my children had been living in the forest since 2021. They told me the names of my children and they did not even know me. 
They told me my children had been starved to death. Dozens of bodies have been found, and authorities say the death toll could rise further. The cult's leader, Paul McKenzie, was arrested earlier this month following a tip-off. On Tuesday, Kenya's interior minister said at least three more people had been rescued alive. The government of Kenya will do whatever it takes to make sure that we convict Mr. McKenzie and all those who helped him perpetrate his heinous crimes. Now, a Japanese company hoping to carry out a rare private moon landing says it is likely its lunar lander crashed on the surface. Engineers are still investigating what exactly happened. A Japanese attempt at the world's first commercial moon landing has failed. Startup iSpace's Hakuto R Mission 1 lander, which was supposed to touch down on the moon's surface on Tuesday, most likely crashed while it tried to land, according to iSpace chief executive Takeshi Hakamada. We lost the communication. So we have to assume that uh, we could not complete the landing on the lunar surface. The Japanese M1 lander was launched four months ago on a SpaceX rocket. If it successfully landed, it would have deployed a rover and tested the performance of an experimental solid-state battery on the moon. The startup says the lander already completed eight out of ten mission objectives in space already, providing valuable data for the next landing attempt in 2024. Tuesday's failure marks the second setback this week for private space development, after SpaceX's Starship rocket exploded minutes after soaring off its launch pad. Only the United States, the former Soviet Union and China have successfully landed spacecraft on the moon, with attempts in recent years by India and a private Israeli company ending in failure. Japan's top government spokesperson Hirokatsu Matsuno said the country wants iSpace to keep trying as its efforts were significant to the development of a domestic space industry. Japan aims to send Japanese astronauts to the moon by the late 2020s, but it suffered setbacks recently, including its new H-3 rocket failing during its debut launch in March. Samsung Electronics posted its worst quarterly results in 14 years, amid falling prices and demand for chips. The sluggish performance will likely continue into the second quarter before gradually improving in the second half of the year. First quarter profits for South Korean tech giant Samsung Electronics almost halved from the previous year amid continued sluggish global chip demand. The company on Thursday reported an operating profit of around 640 billion Korean won, which at the current rate is roughly 477 million US dollars, a dramatic 95.5 percent on-year drop. The figure dropped below the 1 trillion won level for the first time in 14 years. Sales for the same period plunged by about 18 percent on-year to 63.7 trillion won, or 47.5 billion dollars. The latest results were mainly driven by the weaker performance in the industry due to the global economic slowdown. Memory chip prices are falling as demand drops and inventory swells. In fact, the operating loss for the company's chip business came to almost 4.6 trillion won or 3.4 billion dollars. It's the first time Samsung's chip department has posted a deficit since the global financial crisis in 2009. Chip sector sales came to around 14 trillion won or 10 billion dollars, down nearly 50 percent from the previous year. Meanwhile, the firm's DX division, which makes mobile phones and TVs, saw its sales drop slightly from the year before to 46 trillion won or roughly 34 billion dollars. The company predicts sluggish demand to continue in the second quarter as well, but to gradually rise in the second half of this year, with performance expected to recover during that period. Welcome back. Now, for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Peru declared a state of emergency at border regions as it grapples with predominantly Venezuelan migrants coming in from Chile and who are seeking passage through the country. Hundreds of young temple goers gathered at the compound of Beijing's iconic Lama Temple, eagerly lighting up incense sticks and praying for better job prospects. Madame Tussauds London revealed a new wax figure of Britain's Queen Consort Camilla to mark the upcoming King's coronation on May 6th. Standing next to her royal husband, Charles III, and flanked by Prince and Princess of Wales, Prince William and Catherine. 
Former Fox News star Tucker Carlson surfaced publicly for the first time since abruptly leaving the network this week, releasing a videotape statement in which he criticized the state of public discourse on US television. Britain will block Microsoft's $69 billion acquisition of Call of Duty maker Activision Blizzard over its concerns it would hinder competition in cloud gaming. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Now we leave you tonight with a look at a doggy daycare known as Dogtopia, where pups enjoy themselves with an all-day playtime. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.